Welcome. Thank you for joining us this evening. I'm Laura Ferguson, the Senior Curator of Western History at the High Desert Museum. I'd like to open this evening's program with a land acknowledgement. The High Desert Museum sits in and shares the stories of what was, is, and always will be the Indigenous Plateau. We are in the homeland of the Warm Springs, Wasco, and Paiute tribes, known today as the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs. This land has long been a dynamic crossroads, a place where many Indigenous people traveled, gathered, and traded. We extend our respect and gratitude to the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs and all of the Native communities who have lived here for thousands of generations and continue to thrive here today. We recognize the strength, resilience, and sovereignty of the Warm Springs, Wasco, and Paiute people, as well as Native people throughout the Indigenous Plateau, who have long been and continue to be stewards of this land. We're honored to collaborate with the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs and tribes throughout the Plateau to share the stories and knowledge of the Indigenous Plateau. I'm pleased to introduce Stacy Smith a professor in the history department at Oregon State University. Professor Smith specializes in the history of the North American West with a particular emphasis on race relations, labor, and politics during the Civil War and Reconstruction eras. Her book, Freedom's Frontier, California and the Struggle Over Unfree Labor, Emancipation, and Reconstruction won the inaugural David Montgomery Award from the Organization of American Historians and the Labor and Working Class History Association. Her newest book project, An Empire for Freedom, explores African-Americans' migration to the Pacific coast in the middle of the 19th century and their struggle for equality in the US's expanding continental empire. Tonight, Professor Smith will explore the enslavement of Black people in the West and African-American resistance to slavery, as well as how both issues intertwined with anti-Black exclusion laws in Oregon and California. Professor Smith will be answering audience questions at the end of her talk. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please type it into the chat. If you run into a technical issue, please let us know through the chat function as well, and hopefully we'll be able to help. With that, I'm pleased to turn things over to Professor Smith. Well, thanks so much for that very kind introduction. Uh, Laura, let me just go ahead and get my own slides up. I had almost forgotten about that. Uh, so here we go. Uh, so it's really a great pleasure to be here today. I want to thank the High Desert Museum for having me. I want to um, thank Laura Ferguson, who you just heard uh, from, for organizing the event. Uh, and I also want to thank uh, Becca Berta uh, for doing our tech support tonight. Uh, this is really a great pleasure to talk in front of you today. And I really want to thank all of you for being here because, you know, I know it's a gorgeous evening outside. And so I'm really honored that you took the time uh, to spend this hour with me this evening uh, talking about this really important and also kind of difficult, of course, topic. Uh, so I want to start off today by actually talking a little bit about current events. Uh, if you've been following the news, you may know that there have been uh, all kinds of bills and different pieces of legislation, resolutions in a bunch of different states regarding reparations for slavery. Uh, and uh, two of these hit really close to home. Uh, one of these is the most successful, actually, in all the United States so far, is uh, happening in California, where the California legislature and the governor signed into law a new bill that creates a task force to investigate uh, the history of slavery and to make recommendations about reparations for uh, the descendants of enslaved Black people. Uh, we also have a, a bill that was pending in the Oregon legislature, but if I'm not mistaken, that actually ended up uh, sitting in committee and has not advanced in the last legislative uh, session. So uh, what's really interesting about this immediately is 
you don't necessarily think of the Pacific Coast states as being the states where reparations uh, legislation would be happening. Uh, in fact, the reaction I've seen in a lot of the news media is, why are these two states, uh, Oregon, but particularly California, that actually has the most robust uh, reparations law that's actually in force, uh, why, are, is it, why is it these two Pacific states that are involved in this? Why uh, these states that didn't have slavery? Right. Uh, well, as we're going to see today, one of the key arguments that I'm going to make is, well, Slavery did exist in California and in Oregon in this period, even though the, these states were both allegedly free states, according to law. Um, and also, the other idea we'll emphasize today is that when we're talking about reparations for slavery, we're not just talking about slavery itself, which is, of course, uh, tremendously awful in all of its consequences, but uh, or slavery rather had repercussions throughout uh, society in so many different ways. And one of those different ways um, was the black exclusion laws that existed here in Oregon, uh, but and didn't ever get passed in California, but almost did that created hostile environments for uh, black people free and enslaved. Uh, really limiting their civil rights uh, and their economic and social upward mobility. And so a lot of what reparations legislation is aiming at doing is really uh, looking into the long history of generational harm in uh, both during the era of slavery and afterward. And so I think that what we're going to be talking about today is really relevant to thinking about the issues that we're facing right now concerning um, racial justice and uh, the movement to really think about the United States' relationship to slavery and what it owes Black Americans. Uh, so that's just a little bit of uh, background for thinking about our topic today. Uh, I'll just give you just a little bit of an overview of what I will be talking about, sort of my three big questions. Uh, the first of these questions is, uh, why was slavery such a controversial issue on the Pacific Coast? I get this question a lot. Uh, and the sort of uh, intertwined question is, well, wasn't it really unlikely or almost impossible that slavery would ever actually be successful in the West? So what is all this um, controversy over, over an institution that probably was never going to be established in the West? Well, I'm going to try to complicate and debunk uh, some of those ideas for you here at the beginning of the talk today. Um, the other question we'll take a look at uh, is really how did these issues that I mentioned at the start of the talk, uh, anti-slavery sentiment and Black exclusion, how did they go hand in hand on the Pacific coast in the 19th century, in the 1800s? Um, it doesn't necessarily seem logical that we would have groups of people be anti-slavery and say, we don't want slavery here, but also say, we don't want African-Americans here. So that uh, is a tricky question and one that we're going to think through. Uh, and then the very last question that we'll take a look at is, I think, a very important one for today when we think about where we go from here. So I'm going to talk about uh, resistance, successful and unsuccessful resistance to slavery and to anti-Black laws uh, and how those resistance movements shape the histories of Oregon and California. And maybe at the end, um, if we have time, think through uh, a little bit about what that means for our present moment, especially in light of these reparations bills that are pending right now in the state legislatures of many states, especially here out in the West. So that's just a little overview of what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, so we're going to start with this first question. Uh, why was slavery so controversial on the Pacific coast, especially when, uh, according to common wisdom, and this is the sort of, uh, you know, 
narrative that I grew up with in my history textbooks, there's a sort of common idea like, oh, slavery just couldn't actually be established on the Pacific coast. It wasn't feasible. It wasn't viable. Um, it was really just in some ways a non-issue. That isn't true, right? If you uh, heard anything uh, about my research, read a little bit about what I do, a lot of my scholarship is aimed at kind of debunking this idea that slavery wasn't feasible and wasn't established on the Pacific coast. Uh, now, I will acknowledge, however, and it's very important to take note of the fact that not it's not just sort of the establishment of slavery on the Pacific coast that's the issue. It's also the uh, political importance of this question. Okay? If, when we think about uh, slavery on the Pacific coast, right? Uh, and it's an important political question because of the history of westward expansion in the United States. As the United States uh, expanded westward, uh, dispossessed native people of their homelands. Uh, part of the big kind of political issue of this era is whether or not slavery is going to go west with the nation or not. And uh, the way to sort of think about this question is, is slavery the past of the nation, right? Something that is gonna leave behind and leave contained in the states where it already existed, right, the states right here, or is it going to be the future of the nation, a dynamic, uh, important institution that will move west with the United States? Okay, this is really kind of the big question that's at stake, uh, and it's at stake because slavery had expanded pretty rapidly uh, after the founding of the United States. Uh, so we have just a quick comparison of a map between 1790 and one between 1860 that sort of shows us just how rapidly uh, the cotton economy and slavery grew in uh, the years, in the years right after uh, US independence. Okay, so you can see that slavery rapidly expanded, the cotton economy rapidly expanded out of the old coastal uh, southern states and into the deep interior of the Gulf Coast region. Okay. Uh, and a lot of the reason for this, uh, another classic his history book text, a history textbook fact that you probably know, is that this is due to the cotton gin. And that's very correct, right? The cotton gin makes is a machine that makes the uh, production of cotton far uh, easier and cheaper than it had been before. And so cotton just explodes all over the South and with it, uh, slavery. So slavery moves out into these areas and as it does so, repeatedly provokes questions about, well, just how far is slavery going to move West? Okay, so uh, even before our current U.S. Constitution was in force, uh, the early Congress of the United States came up with a way to kind of deal with this question. In 1787, the Northwest Ordinance basically established that this area here in red would be uh, free of slavery. It would not move into these areas. And uh, that, and then basically then there wasn't really any law made about whether slavery could move into this region or not. It was called um, the Southwestern Territory at the time, the Old Southwest, right? This is the Old Northwest, this is the Old Southwest. Uh, and so the whole idea here is like, oh, this is gonna be free. Uh, this is gonna be left open for uh, slavery, perhaps. Uh, if that's what the uh, white people who move there want. So this is how it gets solved in the 18th century, in the 1700s. Of course, though, with that engine of territorial expansion just constantly going westward, propelling the nation westward, uh, this question comes up repeatedly. Uh, so the Missouri Compromise raises this question in 1820. Uh, the United States had acquired this massive territory 
right here, really, uh, all the way through here, uh, the Louisiana Purchase. And then the question is, well, now that there's a Louisiana Purchase, where does slavery go there? Okay, and where can it not go? And so the Missouri Compromise settled that by uh, acknowledging that what is now the president, present day of Missouri would become a slave state. And uh, the state of Maine, which was uh, not a state at the time yet, the state of Maine would be admitted to balance out the addition of Missouri. Now, if you remember your old US history textbooks, the reason that this is important is uh, because of the really the desire to keep the balance between free and slave states in uh, Congress and especially in the US Senate, where as we very well know, each state gets the same number of senators regardless of how populous it is. Uh, so every time there's a new free state or a new slave state, there's this, this really intricate set of negotiations about how many new states are going to be added to try to keep that balance. Uh, and the, the other part of the Missouri Compromise is that all of this area labeled unorganized territory here was supposed to remain free forever, right? Slavery is closed out of there, but slavery can move into uh, what is now Arkansas and Oklahoma under this uh, compromise. Okay, so we've had an, yet another compromise. Uh, and again, right, what's happening here is really trying to maintain that free slave uh, state balance between northern states and southern states. So, uh, of course, the massive uh, territorial acquisitions that happened in the 1840s this time, uh, the settlement of the Oregon country boundary with Great Britain, which happened in 1846, uh, and then the Mexican cession, uh, the essentially the United States seizing this vast uh, territory from Mexico in the U.S.-Mexico War in the 1840s, uh, opened the question again. Okay, open the question again. And so the new question is, well, what are we going to do? Are we going to take this line and draw it all the way to the Pacific? That's what some people wanted to do because it only applied to the Louisiana Purchase. That's important to take note of. Um, so the question is, so what's going to happen to the Oregon Territory, the Mexican session? Uh, is slavery going to go into these areas or not? And so for the early white uh, population of migrants who had settled in these regions, this is a really important political question. And it wasn't just important for them. It was important to almost everybody in the United States, right? This careful balance between free and slave states has to be maintained is, is the idea. Uh, so we understand, uh, hopefully from that, why slavery was a controversial issue sort of in a broader political sense. Uh, now I'm going to kind of get into the uh, details about actually why it was important, not just in the symbolic uh, national political sense, but also important on the ground, right? Trying to kind of debunk this idea that slavery just couldn't succeed here on the Pacific coast. Okay. Uh, and so let's sort of think through that. Now, again, if you were like me, you grew up with uh, hearing this narrative about or the story about natural limits on slavery's westward expansion. So this is the idea that, well, all of this uh, controversy about slavery in the, on the Pacific coast was all just posturing and it was unnecessary arguing because slavery couldn't go to the Pacific coast. Okay? Uh, and that is because of the idea that the West's climate put limits on how far plantation agriculture could expand West. Okay, so that traditional kind of argument would tell us that, okay, so see this line here, right? This sort of line uh, right dead center through the middle of Texas. That the natural limits philosophy says like, well, this is about as far as slavery could go and still be profitable. 
And that's as far as it would go because beyond this line, it's just too dry or too cold for slavery to go any farther into this territory. That may well be, okay? Uh, I'm not disputing that. Uh, what, we, what I am disputing though is the idea that slavery is only plantation agriculture and growing cotton. It was way more than that. Uh, and in fact, uh, a large amount of, or a large number of enslaved people were not employed in growing cotton, right? In this upper south states here, lots of different industries uh, used enslaved labor, okay? In Missouri, there wasn't really cotton production. It was all small farms. So you don't have to have cotton production to have slavery. Slavery is adaptable to a bunch of different climates and uh, economies. And so I'm just going to give you an example of that. Uh, the most kind of obvious example is from my own research, which is on the California gold rush. There is no reason why slavery couldn't be used uh, properly or properly profitably in the California gold country, okay? Just at least on the face of it. Yes, there's opposition to it and, and so forth, but uh, slavery had been a uh, profitable way of conducting mining in Latin America for hundreds of years before the California gold rush. Uh, if you could get enslaved laborers to the Pacific coast, that was the big deal, right? That was the expensive part and the, least, the less feasible part. But if you could get them to the Pacific coast, you could very much employ uh, enslaved people in mining, okay? And the enslaved people who we find out on the Pacific coast are almost all engaged in mining, at least at first. And so we have this very rare uh, picture from the California State Library uh, from 1852, which shows a group, uh, a mixed group of black and white miners. I would strongly suspect that this is a group of slave owners and enslaved people. We don't know who these people are, uh, but this is a common area where the census records have reported there being slavery. So it is very likely that this is a group of slaveholders who have brought enslaved men west with them to work uh, in the California gold country. So we actually have some photographic evidence that suggests this is happening. Uh, we also have census records that make it clear that this was happening. So this, these tables are actually from my own book, uh, Freedom's Frontier, which Laura told you a little bit about. And uh, this shows us that uh, we have enslaved people, not in huge numbers, but we have enslaved people uh, in a really wide variety of areas across California, mostly in the mining country, right? Mariposa, Tuolumne, uh, Calaveras, El Dorado, those are some of the bigger mining uh, county districts in the United States, excuse me. Uh, same thing goes with this special 1852 state census, which shows us uh, that there are quite, a few, or not quite a few, but you know, a fair number of enslaved people for an allegedly free state, California, who are involved uh, in mostly in gold mining. Uh, so enslaved people are in California. The census records them. Sometimes census takers record them as slaves. Okay. Uh, sometimes they're just listed with the people who claim ownership of them. They don't have last names and they're working as minors. So you can kind of figure out uh, through essentially uh, educated guesses who enslaved people are. And I can talk more about that process. I went through the entire 1850 and 1852 censuses looking at this, trying to kind of tease out how many enslaved people we're actually in California. So we have about 203 people I could definitely identify in 1850, uh, about 178 in 1852. The census records are pretty difficult to read and incomplete. I suspect those numbers are higher. I also erred on the side of, of undercounting if I wasn't sure. 
We can also see, as I was saying before, that uh, slavery is a really flexible institution just in terms of the number of uh, different jobs that enslaved people could do. We don't see plantation agriculture here at all, right? People are not growing cotton in California. They are mining, as I already mentioned, and uh, doing all kinds of other things too. And one of the things that they're doing is uh, performing domestic labor, right? Uh, servants uh, in hotels, cooks in restaurants, uh, lots of enslaved people are working those kinds of jobs. And uh, we sort of forget that enslaved people worked in a variety of different occupations in the South. They weren't just plantation agricultural laborers. Uh, so enslaved uh, people could be put to work at a variety of different occupations in a place like California, especially where there's a high demand for people who could cook a good meal right, or um, be a, uh, a housekeeper. This was uh, something that uh, white men who went to California really wanted and didn't have access to. And so enslaved men and enslaved women end up serving in these roles, sometimes even more than they do in mining. Uh, and well, one little thing I was going to tell you about mining, right, this also reminds us that a large number of enslaved people had been involved in mining in the United States before even going to California. So uh, Western North Carolina had several small gold rushes. So did Northern Georgia in the 1820s uh, and 30s. And so some of these uh, enslaved people, especially if you take a look here, uh, oh, I don't have it on here, uh, but those who are listed here in um, Tuolumne County, actually, I think it's this one here in Tuolumne County uh, or San Joaquin County are from North Carolina. And they are from Western North Carolina where mining had already been a highly developed industry using the labor of enslaved people. Okay? So enslaved people uh, were skilled miners already and they're being taken to California because of their skills and their intellect in uh, developing mining practices in North Carolina. So this just to remind us again, uh, slavery had been adapted to a bunch of different uh, different industries and profitably. And there's no reason why it couldn't be adapted to the Pacific Coast. Uh, and another thing that's happening in the California context is that uh, enslaved people are being hired out. We can see this, I mean, this is, again, this is after, well, it's not after statehood, it's right before statehood. This is in California, this is in an openly in a California newspaper. We have J.H. Harper, this man who is saying that he has a valuable woman, 18 years old, who is a good washer, ironer, and cook. This is what I was talking about with domestic labor being in such high demand. And um, he is essentially saying that he is going to sell her to whoever wants her services and implies here that he has indentured her as his servant for two years. So essentially, this is a way that slaveholders can get around slavery. Is they say, this is not an enslaved person. Uh, this young woman is my indentured servant. She's gonna work for, for two years in California. I'm gonna sell her to you and she's gonna to have to work out those two years. And she is going to be a um, laundry woman and a cook for you. So this is how slavery adapts to these circumstances in California. And this is very similar to what slaveholders in places like Missouri were doing during this period. Okay, um, if they had uh, enslaved people who they owned, who they did not uh, want to employ in their own households, they would either sell them or hire them out, uh, which is essentially saying, uh, you know, I don't need the services of this enslaved person, so why don't you uh, pay me for their services? And this person could work for you as a cook in a hotel. 
right? This was something that happened quite a bit in California. And so practices of enslavement that had been developing for decades in response to just different circumstances across the Southern states, all of these adaptations could easily be taken to California, especially since most of the migrants who went to California were um, with enslaved people who came with them were from Missouri or from North Carolina. Places where hiring out was a big deal and places where mining was a big deal. So that's kind of my speech about uh, why we need to think outside of our normal box of, well, plantation agriculture couldn't be out here in Oregon or California. Um, something we want to take note of is that uh, enslaved people were uh, trying to get themselves out of these conditions. Right? So enslaved people were running away. Uh, this is an account uh, that and if you you won't have time to read it carefully, but it's basically about a group of slaveholders who brought a bunch of enslaved people, 20 uh, or so, so enslaved people to Southern California. And some of those enslaved people ran away. And this makeshift posse, if you want to call it that, of slaveholders gets together and chases these people down. And they uh, shoot at them and beat one of the people nearly to death. And so this is appearing in anti-slavery newspapers saying like, look, you may think that California is going to be a free state, but we already have slavery here and enslaved people are trying to get away. And we have violence, brutal violence to try to get these enslaved people back into slavery, even though this is supposed to be a free state. And this is October of 1850, so California had just become a free state about a month before this. And we also have a political situation in California where we have pro-slavery um, legislators and judges who want to keep enslaved people enslaved, even though California did become a free state. And uh, I'm not going to tell you about these men. They were just up there so you can sort of uh, get a sense of who they were. But we've got very high-ranking people in the California Supreme Court, U.S. Senate, who were interested in trying to keep uh, slavery in California, even though it had been formally outlawed. And what they did and this is uh, probably one of the most surprising pieces from my research, what they did is that they passed a law, a state law, a fugitive slave law that said that if you had come to California before statehood, okay, before the moment when California had become officially free state, if you had come to California and you resisted going back to slavery in the South, then the person who claimed you as a slave could hunt you down, have you arrested, and take you back forcibly to slavery. Okay? This is a, a free state on the Pacific coast saying, slaveholders, yeah, you know, just, just take enslaved people back, right? It's, uh, we recognize that you have the right to do that before official statehood, uh, if you would come in before that period. And so California actually has this uh, law on the books for three years in the middle of the 1850s. Slavery does exist in California and there are people who want it to be enforced. Uh, and just to show you also, there are lots of cases uh, of Southerners using this law in order to try to enslave uh, or re-enslave people who refused to go back to enslavement in the South. Okay. So, oh, and I should also say that the California Supreme Court, now there are a lot of people who you're probably scratching your head thinking like, how is this legal, right? How could you say that slavery is a free state and then have these kinds of laws on the book? Well, the California Supreme Court, uh, which uh, included a lot of pro-slavery Southerners, decided in 1852 that that California fugitive slave law, slave law was perfectly acceptable. Um, that it was legal, uh, that before official statehood, it would be unfair and actually illegal to confiscate 
the slaves of anybody who had arrived before um, officially California became a free state. So you actually have the California Supreme Court putting their stamp of approval on this. So hopefully that gives you kind of a sense of why slavery is such a controversial issue on the Pacific Coast. Uh, I probably need to speed up a little bit. So the next question here is, why is it that Black exclusion and anti-slavery went hand in hand? Okay, uh, and again, I think the confusion here comes from sort of the assumption that, well, if you're anti-slavery, you are anti-slavery for humanitarian reasons, meaning you uh, don't want uh, enslaved people to be enslaved, you want rights for free Black people, and that kind of doesn't go together with Black exclusion. Well, if you are so sympathetic to uh, Black people and you don't want them to be slaves, why are you saying they can't come to your state? Why are you not giving them rights? Okay. Uh, and so this is a complicated question, and I think something that confuses a lot of people. So that's why we're going to talk through this. Why could white people in these states, uh, California and Oregon, be anti slavery, not want slavery in their state, but also say, uh, we also don't want African Americans at all to even be in our state. Right? Uh, and you can see here, and this is again sort of a surprising table that shows us that uh, really California and Oregon, which are down here at the bottom of this list, California and Oregon are uh, pretty bad. When we look at the rest of the free states by 1860, are pretty bad. Uh, in their treatment of Black Americans compared to other free states. Okay, so if you take a look here, um, yes, these states had ended slavery, most of them. New Jersey's a little asterisk. You can ask me about that later if you'd like. Uh, but Oregon did not allow African Americans to settle here. You probably know about the Oregon Lash Law. Talk about that in just a minute. Uh, testifying against whites in court, neither California nor Oregon allowed that. And uh, personal liberty laws, which are laws that basically allow Black uh, people who are accused of being fugitive slaves to testify and to support their case in court. Um, they, these were either weak or non-existent in these two states, and neither state allowed African Americans to vote. So when we think about it in terms of the broader scheme of things, Oregon and California are pretty bad when it comes to African American civil rights. Uh, and so let's sort of talk about what this looks like in the state of Oregon. Uh, I'm going to go fairly fast through this timeline, but it's just to kind of give you a uh, flavor for how Oregon moves through this process of banning slavery, but then also having Black exclusion. Okay. So in 1843, uh, settlers in Oregon passed the Organic Laws, which banned slavery. Uh, the next year, uh, the Oregon Provisional Legislature passed that notorious Lash Law. This is probably something you've heard of, basically where uh, the Oregon Provisional Government put into, or Provisional Legislative Council, uh, put into law this really brutal anti-Black exclusion law that said that you'd have two to three years to leave Oregon uh, and face a public whipping every six months until you left. Okay, this is that notorious, notorious lash law. Uh, this got changed. I think uh, even anti-Black uh, activists, if you want to call them that at the time, thought this was a bit over the top. And so it was changed to become softer, uh, which is basically you could be arrested and then auctioned off to work for the person who paid your transportation out of the state. Okay, so this is basically paying someone to get you out of Oregon. Uh, September 21st, uh, 1849, when Oregon becomes a, uh, a territory, an official territory, not just a provisional government, but it has a territory, uh, says that uh, 
any new black migrant who comes into California has 30 days to leave. Those who are already there are fine. New arrivals have 30 days to leave. Uh, May uh, 1st, 1854, the California, excuse me, I'm a California historian, uh, the Oregon legislature nullifies this law accidentally. Whoops, uh, they were overhauling the legal code and they just kind of took it out of the state's legal code. But uh, they put it back in. Uh, Oregon voters were given the opportunity to vote uh, whether they wanted slavery in the state and whether they wanted free black migration in the state. And Oregon voters said no to both of those. We don't want slavery. And these are white male adult citizens doing this voting, we should note. Uh, we don't want slavery and we don't want free black people to be able to come here either. Okay. Uh, now, this law would eventually become defunct and unenforceable when the United States as a whole ratified the 14th Amendment uh, in the late 1860s. So it's not as if it could be enforced after uh, 1868, even though Oregon, uh, and you can ask me about this in the questions, Oregon rescinded its ratification of the 14th Amendment mostly due to questions about Chinese citizenship. So even though Oregon was like, oh, we're not gonna ratify this, it had been ratified by enough states that it was part of the US Constitution and was no longer um, enforceable. Or, and, and so the anti-Black law was no longer enforceable even if Oregon did not like the 14th Amendment. And it took until November of 1926 for the NAACP and the uh, black members of the League of Women Voters to finally get this exclusion law taken off the books. It was a dead letter at this point, but it took this long just to expunge it from Oregon law. So we have this really complicated dynamic where we have slavery and black exclusion working hand in hand, and again, raises this question, why and how would you, uh, could you be anti-slavery, but also, want to exclude African Americans from even coming to the state and having any uh, basic civil rights. Well, a lot of it goes back to a new political creed that you may have heard of, but probably not, called free soil. So as the United States is getting really deeply embroiled in this issue of whether or not slavery can go westward, uh, the people who do not want it to go westward develop what historians now call the free soil ideology. Okay, and by ideology, we just mean a set of political ideas. Uh, the ideas really developed around a piece of legislation called the Wilmot Proviso. This is probably one of the most important and famous pieces of legislation that never actually passed in terms of its consequences. And essentially what it was is that during the war with Mexico, this Democrat named David Wilmot said, look, you know, okay, I guess we're going to fund this war with Mexico, but I'm going to put an, I'm going to uh, attach a rider to a funding bill for the war with Mexico. And I'm going to say that any of this territory taken from Mexico that's going to be free forever. If the United States manages to grab any territory from Mexico, slavery can't go there. And I'm going to make that a condition of funding the U.S.-Mexico war. This was deeply unpopular with a lot of pro-slavery people. It didn't pass, but it awakened uh, a, <clears throat> an ideology uh, that we would refer to again, as the free soil ideology. So here we have this guy who's standing up saying, we don't want slavery to go westward. And the reasons, uh, and here's just the area that would have uh, been prohibited, or where slavery would have been prohibited uh, if the Wilmot Proviso had passed. Just run through that. Uh, why does Wilmot uh, do this? Is he against slavery? Well, he explains it this way. He says, I make no war upon the South nor upon slavery in the South. And he says he isn't really sympathetic for, to slaves at all. 
I plead the cause of the rights of white freemen. I would preserve for free white labor a fair country, a rich inheritance where the sons of toil of my own race and own color can live without the disgrace which association with Negro slavery brings upon free labor. I stand for the inviolability of free territory. It shall remain free so far as basically I can get it to be that way, right? Uh, and then he goes on, the white labor of the North wants you to defend him. He demands that you stand firm to his interests and his rights, that you preserve the future homes of his children on the distant shores of the Pacific from the degradation and dishonor of Negro servitude. And this is kind of the key point uh, here that we'll see in just a moment, where the Negro slave labors, Wilmot says, the free white man cannot labor by his side without sharing in his degradation and disgrace. So this is the ideology of free, uh, free soil. Okay? Uh, basically the idea is that the West needs to be saved for free white people and uh, so that they can have economic prosperity on the distant shores of the Pacific and where they can work without being dishonored by being associated with slave labor. Uh, so the whole idea here is that if, uh, that Wilmot is kind of invoking is that if you are a white free person and you're working on your family farm and you look over next door and you see that there is an enslaved person or even a free black person working doing the same job as you um, that is going to be degrading okay uh, essentially what he's saying wherever a black person enslaved person labors that degrades white people and their labor and we see this kind of free labor argument, a uh, free labor and free soil argument being uh, peddled all over. I'm gonna skip through a few slides here since I'm uh, running close to being out of time. Okay. Uh, we see these arguments come up in both California and Oregon. Okay. Uh, and so California didn't ever actually pass a black exclusion law, they tried to uh, the California legislature tried four or five times to do this, but it never happened. Uh, and if we see just some quotations from people who were on the scene, here is what they had to say. They're basically echoing David Wilmot. Uh, so you've got this guy, uh, James McCall Jones in California saying, the labor of the, of the Negro is always degraded. Okay, do you think that uh, respectable, intelligent people are gonna come to the mines? Will they dig with the African, he writes? No, they're gonna leave California if we insist on uh, allowing uh, enslaved or free black people to come here. Oliver Rosencraft uh, says something very similar and essentially though says that, well, you know what's gonna happen? Rich guys, capitalists are gonna fill up this land with enslaved people and they're gonna get wealthy and um, or, or free black people. And they're going to, to drive those uh, black people very hard and they're gonna drive everyone else out of business. Uh, and then you even have California's governor, first governor, Peter Burnett, who's actually a big figure in getting this, this type of law passed in Oregon, who's essentially saying that, um, that free black people are going to feel that uh, they're that there's nothing for them in California. Their rights are so restricted that we shouldn't even allow them to become uh, California citizens because they're going to become degraded and unhappy. And eventually, Burnett would say they're going to wage war on the white people of California. Okay. Uh, very similar types of. Uh, rationale for exclusion in uh, Oregon. One thing that though you'll notice about uh, what some of these uh, folks in Oregon are saying is that they, they're also worried about this question of race war. 
uh, that, you know, if either enslaved or free Black people are allowed to come to Oregon, then they're going to cause a race war, uh, but, and because they're going to have their rights limited, and they're going to, you know, force white laborers out of good jobs and good land holding opportunities. But what you'll notice here, if you take a look at some of these, is they're very worried that there's going to be interaction between American Indian peoples, right? The native peoples of Oregon and uh, free black people, and that they are going to rise up and kill or subjugate all of the white people in the territory. And that, uh, and we can talk more about that in a bit, but that is, uh, ends up being um, an additional more complex rationale for exclusion than we actually see in California. Lots of concern about, well, we have Native American people who might join Black people in the cause um, of, you know, fighting oppression, and they might try to overturn white rule in Oregon, and how horrible would that be? So these are some of the reasons that you see as justifications for exclusion. And this is also the, uh, and for not allowing slavery. And this is also a large part of why Oregon and California are passing these anti-slavery laws. And then we have Oregon passing its exclusion law. So uh, it looks like I'm over time here. Uh, I'm just going to end by very quickly saying that uh, if we want to think about resistance, right? How did people resist these laws? And was that resistance effective? Um, actually, I'm going to skip through some of these here. I want to just really emphasize that interracial allyship, interracial cooperation to fight these injustices, to fight this impression, uh, oppression rather, was really important in both Oregon and California. Uh, only one man, Jacob Vanderpool, was ever actually expelled from Oregon, as far as we know. And part of the reason that that was the case was that um, Black Oregonians had their white neighbors stand up for them and help them to fight this oppression, right? So uh, we have at least uh, two or three petitions where we actually had the white neighbors of Black families saying, like, look, these are upstanding people. They shouldn't be expelled. They need to be exempted from this harsh law. Okay. Um, and you also have people being willing to stand up to slavery in places like Oregon. Uh, we have uh, the George Williams, the Chief Justice of the or Oregon Territorial Supreme Court, very different than the Supreme Court of California saying like, look, the state's law or the territory's laws are very clear. We don't have slavery here and in the case of Holmes versus Ford rules that uh, a group of enslaved people need to be reunited with their parents. Uh, so in closing there, I'd just say, this is, I think, really important to think about in terms of uh, the reparations debate going on right now in both California and in Oregon. Uh, if we think about this long history of slavery and Black exclusion, uh, we, can, oh, we can think about really the ways that uh, enslaved Black people, uh, free Black people have uh, suffered historically from oppression uh, in these states, even though we don't think of these states as being slave states. And I, again, I want to emphasize that it took in uh, both California and Oregon white people standing up and being allies to free and enslaved Black people to uh, protest and to resist this type of oppression. And I think that's exactly uh, the sort of thing we need to think about as we have these conversations about reparations and national he healing on the question of slavery and Black civil rights. So I'm going to end there. I went a bit over. I very much apologize for that. You can tell I'm very animated. Uh, so Laura. Thank you so much, Stacey. I really appreciate what you had to share with us. And one of the things that I am curious to hear a bit more about is, you know, you talked about some of the misconceptions, some of the things that continue to be taught about 
you know, the, that slavery somehow couldn't come West and you really persuasively argued that it could. And I am curious what you think of, you know, what are these misconceptions are, are kind of still so prevalent that are most cloudiness from being able to understand what's going on today? I guess what, what kind of, if you could kind of try to puncture, uh, you know, what, what misconception do you feel like is, is kind of one of the more prevalent ones that's really impeding our understanding? So I think, um, and again, I'm a California historian, so I'm sorry to be using those examples quite a bit, but I think this also uh, applies to Oregon to some extent, is that there's this uh, great mythology about the American West uh, and the Pacific Coast as a place of freedom, as a place of sort of unlimited, uh, both geographic and uh, economic upward mobility, right? So that uh, when we think about the popular images of it's all of, of this period of the 19th century, we think of white people going west and accomplishing things and pull, pulling themselves up from their bootstraps. Everyone was kind of free to pursue their economic interests, free to, to move around, uh, free to get rich. And that really is a strong narrative. You could see it's it's you know it's the basis of certainly the California dream and probably also of the American dream, right? This notion that America is a place where everybody has these opportunities, and so it is, I think, deeply distressing to um, some people when I talk about this history, when it appears that California and Oregon are not these places in the 19th century, right? They were places where in fact, uh, and the part I didn't even get into is that there's a lot of enslavement of Native Americans in California. Far, far more enslaved uh, uh, people of indigenous background than of African American background in California. And this really, un is people find this unsettling and challenging to think about in a place that our mythologies have so characterized as a as a free country, like right? it's a place where you could escape the old north-south conundrum of slavery, that puzzles slavery, go west and everybody's free and has equal opportunity. And this is a real blow to that. And so that I think that that's one of the biggest kind of operating mythologies or false ideas that I kind of encounter quite a bit in my own research. Absolutely, that makes a lot of sense, and that, and I think that, as you mentioned, that, that mythology in many ways is still is still with us, is something that that people still hang on to. I want to invite, please feel free if you have a question to put it in the Q and A box at the bottom. Um, I'm curious to to hear more about um, about the resistance, about the portion that I know that you you know needed to that go a little bit more, yeah. more quickly, um, because I do it it and I, it's a very necessary corrective that there's been more emphasis of talking about exclusion laws, but I think also you know understanding that alongside the resistance and and kind of knowing. Um, the, the framers of the Oregon Constitution, their intent was absolutely important, but as, as was, you know, what was happening on the ground. So can you share with us just a little bit more about what was going on on the ground? Uh, in terms of Black exclusion? In terms of resistance. Yeah. And, and in terms of resistance. Yeah, so um, maybe I'll come back to some of these slides. This is how I sneak, sneak this in, right, shoehorn all of this in. Um, is that, so we do, again, what I, I think it's pretty fascinating that there was, um, oops, you know, there really was, as far as we know, this one major example of exclusion, which is kind of surprising given that, you know, how horrible these laws were, right? You'd sort of think like, well, they're, you know, it's just everybody's going to be whipped and and um, thrown out, and we have we definitely have one clear example in which this happened. But I really do think it is because of this resistance and sort of standing up against these unjust laws that uh, this didn't happen more often. Uh, now, part of what's going on, of course, is that what Oregon is doing is what, the, you know, what legislators intended to do, which is say, hey, you're not welcome here. And when free Black people are sort of like, all right, well, we've taken the message. 
not all of course, but there is probably a reason why most go to California and not to Oregon in this period so that, that's preventing migration in the first place but i you know i think it is important to acknowledge that there are these cases where um you know free black people are just living their lives may not have even been as far as we know in the case of abner francis um he wasn't even really aware that this law was on the books uh he came to oregon and then was kind of like hey by the way we have this law and he was shocked and stunned. And we have his letters to uh, an abolitionist newspaper back east saying like, look, I didn't, even, I didn't even really realize that this was going on here in Oregon. News didn't travel very quickly. And then all of a sudden I'm finding myself the subject of um, a, a essentially a, a prosecution where I'm being told I've got uh, just a few days to, to leave the state or else I'm gonna be forcibly excluded. And so I think that there's this you know, sort of moment where uh, Black people who are already in the state are sort of like up in arms, kind of what, what just happened? Why did this happen? And in these cases, they had already established businesses, families, homes, and uh, they win the sympathy of their white neighbors who are sort of like, Look, this person is not causing all of these problems that the legislature says is going to happen. Uh, you need to exempt these uh, uh, families from this law. And so I think, but on the other hand, it doesn't change the law, right? And in fact, these cases both happen before statehood and Cal, or excuse me, Oregon goes ahead and passes in Black exclusion law anyway in 1857. We find that the majority of white voters wanted that. Um, so I wouldn't want to overestimate it either. Right. Uh, but I think it's, you know, it's important to say there these exemptions sort of show that there is a, a groundswell. And I think of, you know, when white people actually were getting to know their Black neighbors, were sort of like, this law is ridiculous. Uh, and I think it's, you know, fear-mongering in a more general way that's getting people to kind of vote for these Black exclusion laws. Um, uh, but when you actually have families interacting with their Black neighbors, I think the dynamic changes. And again, I'm not trying to overstate that at all. I think there's a lot of anti-Black violence and hostility in Oregon, yeah. as shown in all these different laws. But we've got yeah. these little moments of resistance. Exactly. Well, thank you so much, Stacey. I just really appreciate you sharing your research, helping us to understand a little bit more about specifically what was going on in California and in Oregon. And thank you too for underscoring, you know, how much this is so important to thinking about what's going on today and especially the discussion around reparations. So I, I really appreciate all that you had to share with us tonight. And thank you to all of you who joined us virtually. And I hope that you have a good rest of your evening. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, thanks to everybody for coming out tonight.